My name is Dr. Shane Arishenkoff. I'm the ultrasound lead for the Division of General Internal Medicine at UBC. Today I'm going to talk about my favorite topic, which is lung ultrasounds. We'll go over the normal lung scan and talk about ultrasound presets, uh, transducer selection, a systematic approach to scanning the lung, as well as uh, optimization and interpretation of the lung images. When it comes down to selecting the preset, I would recommend for the most part that we're going for the uh, abdominal preset, which is a very simplified uh, preset that is good for a, a, a comprehensive scan of the lungs. For the Clarius machine, they've set up an excellent uh, comprehensive lung scanning preset that can be used. For the transducer, I would go for the curvilinear array transducer. This provides the depth of penetration that's necessary in order to do a comprehensive lung scan. Next, we'll move on to uh, a systematic approach to scanning the entire lungs. To start off with, I'm just going to double check that I've got my lung settings on. I've got the, trans or the depth of the transducer at at least 10 to 12 centimeters or so. And then I'm going to start off uh, just on the patient's anterior superior chest uh, in the sagittal plane. I'm going to take the transducer marker here and orient it up towards the patient's head and place it in the long axis or sagittal plane. In this position, I know that everything towards the left side of the screen is going to be up towards the patient's head. Everything towards the right side of the screen is going to be down towards the patient's feet. The first thing I want to be able to do is identify where the ribs are. To begin with, I note that there's a couple of these dark shadows that spread out down across the screen. And as I follow those up, uh, superficially, I can see the hyperechoic arcs of the anterior surface of the ribs just uh, sitting in the soft tissue here. Once I've identified that position, I know that the pleural line is just about half a centimeter or so below that anterior surface of the rib. You can see that there's all kinds of horizontal lines on the screen here, and sometimes it can be difficult to pick out which one is the pleural line. And I know here, just with these uh, landmarks of the of the ribs that the pleural line has to be this or has to be this horizontal line right here. Once I've identified the pleural line, I want to then go on to describe just a couple of artifacts that I see in a normal lung scan. The first one is, is if we focus up at the pleural line itself, we can see that there is um, some motion artifact uh, across that horizontal line. This can be seen as either sparkling or scintillation. Some people describe it as ants marching across the pleural line, which just indicates that those two pleura, the visceral and parietal pleura, are opposed to each other. The second important uh, artifact that I want to talk about are A-lines. These are um, horizontal artifacts that I can see here coursing across the screen deep to the pleural line. These A-lines are produced uh, as a result of the hyperreflective uh, 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 the hyper pleural line um, that indicates that we're at a soft tissue air interface. This soft tissue air interface sets up that very hyperreflective surface that causes all of our beam to be reflected back towards the transducer and that everything below here, below the pleural line, is actually artifact. Because of that hyperreflective surface, it actually sets up a reverberation artifact or a bouncing pattern that happens between the uh, soft tissue uh, uh, air interface here at the pleura and the interface between the soft tissue and the transducer. I know that these uh, horizontal artifacts, this art horizontal artifact here is an A-line because it sits about equidistant from the uh, surface of the chest wall to that pleural line. And these A-lines then repeat uh, across the screen at regular intervals. It's important to talk about uh, also the fact that it's, you have to make sure that you're insinating the pleura at the right angle in order to produce these artifacts. The beam has to be oriented at about a perpendicular angle to that pleura in order to produce those. This is sometimes different than um, being perpendicular to the chest wall as the contour of that pleura is often very different than the contour of the chest wall. You can see here as I place my transducer just perpendicular to the chest wall or perhaps a little bit off the perpendicular, it's very difficult for me to make out where that pleura is and I don't really see any of those nice A-lines coursing down the screen. But as soon as I reorient the beam a little bit more medial to the patient, 
I start to see the plural line really become much more crisp and clean looking, much brighter. And I also start to see the appearance of these A lines that are occurring at regular intervals across the screen. Having seen both the plural sliding as well as these A lines, I can say that this scan is consistent with a normal lung. Unfortunately, I can't say for sure just with A lines that this is a normal, that this has to be a normal lung. As we can see A lines in anything where we have a soft tissue air interface, including a pneumothorax or a COPD or a big pulmonary bleb. I can differentiate, however, a normal lung from a pneumothorax given the fact that I see this pleural sliding here occurring across the pleural line. Sometimes it's difficult to see at a depth of 11 centimeters or 12 centimeters, so what I can do is just zoom in a little bit on that in order to accentuate that pleural sliding that happens across the pleural line. Once again, and I see this, it's a very sensitive sign for pneumothorax, and thus this pleural sliding that we see here now rules out the presence of a pneumothorax. I'm going to back out again to about 12 centimeters and next go on to talk about a systematic approach to scanning uh, the entire lung. So to start off, I'm going to begin with the anterior chest, which is divided by the anterior axillary line and the sternum. I'm going to divide that into a, a superior and inferior zone. The division there is just above the nipple line. So to begin with, again, as I was previously doing, I'm going to place my transducer down in the uh, superior anterior lung zone, place those rib shadows on either side, and all I'm looking for is to identify that indeed there is lung sliding, there are those A lines, and in this lung zone I've been able to say then that there is no pneumothorax and there is nothing within the interstitium of the lung such as pneumonia or pulmonary edema when I see this pattern. Next, I'll slide my transducer down to the inferior lung zone, placing it at about just the level of the nipple. Again, changing the, the uh, angle of my beam to ensure that I'm per as perpendicular as possible to that pleural line. And I see this beautiful, bright, uh, uh, clean and crisp uh, pleural line here with those regular repeating horizontal artifacts that suggest again that I've got that nice soft tissue air interface and nothing within the lung parenchyma. I'll move on to the lateral lung zone, and to do that, I'll get the patient to place his hand above his head, thereby exposing the lateral aspect of the chest. The lateral lung zone is divided by the anterior axillary line and the posterior axillary line. And again, I'm going to divide that at about the level of the nipple into the superior and inferior uh, part of that lateral chest. For the superior zone, I'm going to place the transducer in about the mid-axillary line or so, making sure that I'm getting right up into the, patient, the base of the patient's axilla, changing the pitch of my transducer to bring out those nice A lines and crisp up the pleural line, and again I see that same pattern that indicates that I've got that consistent scan, or a scan that is consistent with a normal lung. I'll now move down to the inferior lung zones. To do this, what I first want to do is differentiate between the abdomen and the thorax in order to ensure that I'm indeed at the most inferior portion of the lung. On the right side, I can use the external landmark coming from about the height of the epigastrium down to about the mid-axillary line. If I place my transducer in that position, you can see basically I land right on top of the liver. Now I've clearly delineated exactly where the abdomen is, and as I slide my transducer up into the patient's chest, I start to see that normal pattern of the lung come into view again. Here I know that I'm, I'm indeed at the, that, uh, uh, that position where I'm at the border of the chest as well, or the chest and the thorax. In order to uh, fully interrogate for the possibility of a very small pleural effusion, I'm going to want to come down right uh, to the most inferior portion of his chest in order to identify um, that most dependent region. It's useful first to identify again the liver and find the spine, and I, which I can see here is an undulating hyperechoic white line just beneath the liver. As I slide up into the patient's chest, you can see that the spine ends at the pleural line. This indicates that there must be lung coming down into the deepest recess of that costophrenic uh, uh, recess and therefore is not allowing any uh, 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 beam to penetrate uh, deeper into the chest. This, in effect, is called the V-line or the spine sign and rules out the possibility of a pleural effusion. 
The other thing that you might see, as we see here, is just a little bit of a mirror image artifact that's coming across from the liver. And once again, if uh, uh, you see that mirror image artifact, there cannot be a pleural effusion in this most dependent region of the chest. I'll then move on to the left hemithorax, starting up in the anterior chest. Again, I see my ribs. I see the pleural line nice and bright. I'm going to make sure that I've got the transducer oriented such that I uh, maximize the uh, angle of incination of that pleural line. And once I see those A lines, I'm confident that I've got a nice soft tissue air interface and I'll move down to the more inferior portion of the left lung. Here you can see I start to come over top of the heart, so I need to actually slide a little bit more lateral here in order to find that lung again. I've got a nice pleural sliding, A lines, I'm done in that portion of the chest and I can move on to the lateral aspect. Getting the patient to put his arm up above his chest again, I'll start up in the superior zone of that lateral chest, orient my beam such that I'm going to nicely be able to identify that pleural line, see those A lines present, and again just slide down to the inferior portion of that patient's left chest. It is helpful first on this side also to identify where the abdomen is, and the key landmark here is going to be the spleen. I see the spleen sitting right here. I'm at about the level of the epigastrium again, dropping down this time to the posterior axillary line in order to find the spleen, and then sliding my transducer up towards his uh, lungs, finding that border between the chest and the abdomen, and again identifying that I've got this nice pleural sliding and repeating A lines down the screen that suggest that I've got a nice soft tissue air interface. And again, because I'm already at the posterior axillary line, I'm doing a very good job for looking for the possibility of even a small pleural effusion. I can identify that spine on this side as well and note again that it's ending at the border of the chest wall and the abdomen, again ruling out the possibility that of, a, of a pleural effusion. Once I've done the patient in the supine position, I've scanned his anterior and lateral chest, I want to move on to the posterior chest. The posterior thorax is divided by the midline here at the spine and the posterior axillary line. And once again, we can divide the posterior thorax into a superior and inferior zone. To position the patient, we'll get him just to wrap his arms around himself as if he's giving himself a hug. This will pull the scapula out a little bit more laterally and free up some lung here in the superior aspect of the thorax. Once again, I'll take my transducer and place it in the, long, or in the sagittal plane with the uh, transducer marker oriented up towards the patient's head. Again, I'm looking for those lung or the rib shadows, the anterior surface of those ribs, and then that nice hyperechoic surface of the pleura. I see those nice repeating A lines once again that signifies that I've got a lung scan that is consistent with a normal lung. From there I'll move down to the inferior portion of the lung. It's useful again to identify where the abdomen ends and where the thorax starts. On the posterior chest on the left side here, what we'll do is try to identify where the spleen is first. To do that I can come to the costal margin, place my transducer, just a little bit lateral with respect to that chest wall and first I can identify exactly where that spleen is. Once I know where the spleen is, I'll slide my transducer back up into the thorax. Again, looking at that nice sliding across the pleural line, the A lines repeating across the screen and again consistent with a normal looking lung and I've been able to do that in the most dependent region of the lung while the patient is sitting up. From there I'll move over to the patient's right side and continue on by starting in the superior surface of the lung. Placing my transducer again just up here, playing with the overall um, uh, direction of the beam, trying to become as perpendicular to that pleural line as possible. I see that nice bright hyperechoic white surface with sliding, repeating A lines that I see a coursing across the screen, once again consistent with a normal lung. Now coming down to the inferior portion of the right side of the lungs, I'm going to find that costal margin, place my probe just a little bit on the lateral aspect of that posterior chest, and I'll be able to find uh, the liver as well as a little bit of the kidney that's sitting there. Then I'll slide the transducer back up into the thorax, change the pitch of my probe in order to uh, get it as perpendicular to the pleural line as possible, and once again, note that I've got that nice pleural sliding, repeating A lines that suggest I've got that soft tissue air interface that's consistent with a normal lung. That completes a fairly comprehensive scan of the lungs, including the anterior, uh, lateral, and uh, posterior aspect of the thorax. In doing so, I've covered all of the lobes of the lung. 
and pretty much should be, uh, have been able to identify any significant uh, pathology that was in the chest. Once you've learned how to scan the normal lungs and recognize the artifacts that are associated with that, you'll be able to now move on and start to learn some of the other uh, findings that we can see uh, with the ultrasound that will help you identify other pathology in the chest. This includes looking for pleural effusions, looking for pneumothoraces, uh, looking for a pulmonary edema, and even looking for things like a pneumonia or a pulmonary contusion. What's brilliant about lung ultrasound is that the test characteristics for all of these pathologies is actually much better than you uh, would see with a chest x-ray. And in addition, very easy to learn um, and something that you can master in a very short period of time and still give you a, a significant amount of information.